Um, welcome. Um, welcome to the University of Arizona Department of Psychiatry at Grand Rounds. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Casey Butt. Dr. Butt graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School. Uh, had a number of accolades while she was there. Um, went to do her family medicine internship at the Swedish Hospital in Seattle. We were fortunate enough to have a position opened in this PG2 year, and Dr. Budd joined us as a PG2 to finish her psychiatry residency. Um, she is mere months from graduating and uh, is excited about the prospect of continuing on in her educational um, goals. And um, I've had the good fortune of working with Casey uh, pretty closely throughout the residency. And, and she's grown tr tremendously, and um, I think she uh, is uh, uh, somebody who um, really has learned a lot in the residency and has really been able to incorporate that into her own uh, specific style. And, um, and I think that will be beneficial for all the patients that she sees in the future. So um, without further ado, the only other thing I have to make the disclosure for is that uh, she has nothing to disclose with respect to um, uh, affiliations with any pharmaceutical companies or anything. So uh, with that, I welcome Casey and, and uh, enjoy. Okay, so the topic is art as medicine, the use of creativity for healing in psychiatry. So I'm your creative host, Casey Budd. Um, and I wanted to just take a minute to, I can't decide if I wanna sit or stand, um, to talk about, I think I'll stand, why this topic was the perfect one for me. Um, many of you know me, and I'm really creative as a person, and that started back in childhood. And then in high school, I studied art, kind of semi-seriously, I guess you might say. I showed, I showed some pieces in local shows, and I won the Most Outstanding Senior Art Award in my school, which was a big public high school, and that was quite an honor. But then in college, I decided to be pre-med, so I went into medicine, but I was still really interested in why people made art. I just thought it was so fascinating. It always was such a joy to me. So I took an art history class, and that turned into like 10 art history classes, and then I had an art history minor. And uh, for my senior project in my art history minor, I created an art therapy program for cancer patients at Duke, which was where I was in college. And this was just an idea, because I wanted to do something creative within my parameters for the project. And I'd never done art therapy before with anyone else. You know, I sort of just made it up based on abstract expressionism and what I knew about what was going on in art history. So I just proposed this program to the Ronald McDonald House, created it, got funding, uh, ran it myself for six weeks. It was an amazing experience. and. You know, of course I got an A in the class, but then I went on to, to med school and I was so enthusiastic about art therapy. I founded a program at Michigan in, in the children's hospital there, also in art therapy. I called it art outreach. And I got a bunch of medical students to help me and we got funding and we sort of made a big deal with this one. And um, it was just a wonderful experience and it really set the stage for me use, using creativity for the rest of my healing work with people. And some of you might know that uh, Dr. Weiss, Dr. Gilbert, and I have done the mind-body skills training. So this was sort of what I saw as the next step after medical school. I did this training in mind-body skills. And then I took what I learned from the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and doing mind-body skills groups. I, I put in what I already knew about art therapy and movement therapy, which I'd been studying on my own and yoga, because I'd become a certified yoga instructor. And so I put all this together and started making my own um, brand of creative healing. So that's a little background. So 
I'm going to put some art throughout just to illustrate my point. So I, I drew this on Sunday as I was really trying to get everything put together and move from the kind of linear world of all the research I was doing into the sort of visual world of what I was really trying to express. So I thought the best way to demonstrate that creativity is healing is for us to do a little experiment. So that's what the oil pastels and cups are. So if everybody can just find an, a cup of oil pastels that's near you and a piece of paper with the circles on it and take one of each. And there, there are some Kleenex scattered throughout in case you get oil pastels on your hands and you want to clean up. Does everybody have what they need? Anybody need anything? Okay. So, what we have is a page. I want you to divide it into three quadrants, representing past, present, and future. You're going to have three minutes for each quadrant, and I'm going to time you and just let you know when to move on to the next quadrant. So, using your non-dominant hand, non-dominant hand, just... Um, Go with whatever colors um, that you have that inspire you and proceed with the exercise. Past, present, future, three minutes each. Okay? So start. Whatever comes up, just draw. Keep, hold in mind past, present, or future, and then just colors, images, whatever comes up. Just, just put, it, put something on paper with your non-dominant hand.
Okay, so you can go ahead and stop the last one. So, um, so now just take a moment and look at what you've drawn. And it may even be helpful to hold it out in front of you. A lot of times if, you, if we have space to do something like this, we might you know, step back away from it. So just kind of hold it away from it, hold it away from you so you can get a more of a, a far away perspective on what you've done. And then just, just make some impressions for yourself. Just, just note, you know, what did I draw? What, was, what came to me? And what is that, what is that trying to say? Or wh why would I draw that? 
and just sort of look at the past, present, and future and look at, at why you chose to draw what you did and, and what came through. Look at the quality of the lines. Were your lines more angular and rough or, or did you draw smooth shapes? Did you draw circles? Did you draw more shapes or did you draw actual images of things, words? Were you inside the lines, outside of the lines? Did you do past, present, future just like that? You know, the whole way that you use the page can help just inform you about your, your process and how you approach this task and how you approach other tasks, perhaps. perhaps. So, you know, just, you know, noting patterns of color, the overall energy, you know, is it positive, is it negative, sad? Um, do you feel relieved from doing it? Do, is there anything different at all about your energy from having done that? So, that's the... That's the kind of end. How, how do you feel after doing that? I have a question. Yes. That may not be an answer, but uh, why the non-dominant hand? Why do you think? I uh, saw the side of my brain that's creative or something. I don't know. Or because it's more challenging. How, what, did you want to answer her question? I, I have a theory about it. OK. Go ahead. <laughs> Are you finished with your question? Yes. OK. Um, does it have anything to do with, like, I'm thinking of, like, inner child psychology, if it's somehow supposed to represent some sort of connection from the inner child part of the self that lets out the emotions more easily or something? I mean, that, you know, I haven't had it, heard it phrased exactly that way, but I think that, that both of you are on to something about it, you know, it's, it, it, just take, it just takes you into a place where you're not going to be as judgmental and critical of what you're doing because you, you can't be as perfect with your other hand. So it adds this element of um, just, just that this is really an exercise to get you out of yourself in a way and just see what comes through rather than trying to make a perfect product. So I think that it could have implications like what you're talking about and what you're talking about. So did anybody else go out of the lines? <laughs> That's why I specifically said quadrants in the beginning rather than circles. So, um, so I thought we would do some definitions just to give us an idea of what we're talking about. Um, what is art? What is healing? So there are so many definitions, but I chose that art was anything generated with the intention of imaginative self-expression and healing. I call an, a deep personal process through which a person attains or regra regains a sense of wholeness or wellness. So for this, in preparation for this lecture, I read tons and tons of articles about all the different kinds of healing art therapies. And for the purposes of time, I really had to narrow it down. So I'm staying with visual art mostly for this topic, I mean, for this talk. but. There's lots and lots and lots of kinds of art, you know, performance, gardening, cooking, songwriting, anything that feels like it's a creative um, outpouring of your being is, is included. So healing is an inner journey that can take place on an emotional, spiritual, or physical level, I'm supposed to say. People may heal without their physical body being cured of a disease. This is an important idea. Becoming whole, even through the vehicle of illness, is a magically precious gift. So this is just a little drawing I did with oil pastels like you have. Um, during an art therapy session I did with one of my mind body skills groups in 2005 in Telluride. So I thought I'd give a little history of using art for healing. It's, there's a lot out there about this, but I just thought I'd cover a few main points. So probably the first healing artists were mothers who, you know, from the beginning of human history used to sing and hum to their infants. Most likely original songs until songs started being shared and recorded and then songs were shared and recorded. But mothers have always also sung original songs. And fathers used to make beds for their babies and now they buy them. But you know, that's still their offering in a way. 
Tribal people were self-healers self self originally when everybody used to be hunter-gatherers and the community was much more integrated and everybody shared roles together. People seemed to naturally know what they needed to do to heal themselves and they had a lot of community rituals such as drumming, campfires, dancing, all night sort of rituals that would help people connect to spirit and thus to their deeper sense of healing and they would process what they needed to do in that way to feel like they had reached wholeness. Shaman evolved when societies became more agrarian, more um, agricultural, localized in, in one place. People started specializing, so they had people making baskets, people farming, people hunting, you know, all the different tasks. And the shaman were the people who stayed more connected to spirit and source, so they started to do that role for other people. And art started popping up, such as talismans, which were special mystical art objects that usually were visions seen when the shaman would go on their journeys and then they would come back and they'd make these art objects that then they could use to heal with other people. And also cave drawings were thought to represent early healing art uh, because a lot of the images were of things seen in visions or things that, um, think like buffalo, things that were hunted that they wanted to really connect with and merge with because the hunt was such a spiritual thing for early people. So a little more about rituals, early form of healing performance art at community or social level, use symbols and ceremonies to help people move through change with meaning, gave a wholeness to the cycle of loss and gain, death and birth, spiritual healing, nature, connection with God were all a part of ritual activity. So all the, all the old cultures and most of the indigenous current cultures have lots of rituals and so do we. Greek, Celtic, Egyptian, and every culture has rituals, myths, and symbols. One of my favorite was um, the story of Eleusis and the Eleusinian Mysteries, and another is Halloween. Um, the Eleusinian ritual was one of ancient Greece, and it had to do with the Persephone Demeter myth. I don't know if everyone knows about this, but it's, it's just an interesting Greek myth about uh, Demeter losing her daughter Persephone to Hades who wanted to marry her and took her, kidnapped her into the underworld and and through time in Greece there was a reenactment of this myth which they thought was supposed to help connect them to the gods as well as perpetuate the positive uh, fertility cycles of the land. So people got involved in sort of performing these rituals to try to help the land grow and also to try to connect themselves to the gods. And Halloween was originally a Celtic, Celtic um, ritual to celebrate and mourn the dead. Um, people made meals for their dead relatives. They set places for them at their table. They cooked things and buried things in the ground for their dead to take with them as they made their journey to the other side. This helped them as well as they thought it helped their loved ones move on. And then in our field we have uh, Jung with his archetype symbols and mythology and Freud and Jung with their emphasis on dream work. So they were also kind of early creative uh, artists within our field. Freud, as everybody knows, believed the unconscious expressed itself through dreams and fantasies. And both seem to believe that images could provide information that simple speech and words could not, and that we could really get deep into something that was going on with a patient if we looked at what kind of images were coming up, because a lot of times these were you know, pre-verbal, pre-conscious things. Um, and, and Jung was apparently a really great artist, and he recorded lots and lots of images from his dreams. Lost my pointer. So this is a dream image that I painted. So a basic way into this work with your patients is to pay attention to your dreams and those of your patients. Notice what images and symbols predominate in your dreams. And if you or your patient is already drawing, you can notice what kind of things you tend to doodle about. Spirals, stars, suns, fire, trees, dragons, and snakes. These things tell us something about where we or our patient are or is and what we or our patients might need right now for healing and balance.
So it's always important to ask, what do you think that symbol or image means to you for your life right now? Why is it here now? What does it say to you? My personal favorite healing art image is a mandala, and that's anything that draws you into center. So these are things that are found in nature all around us, even like raindrops in a puddle, a nautilus. But it, it's an image that symbolizes the journey to the center or the journey to the core of your being, um, which would ultimately mean oneness or union with God. They're very peace, peace bringing images that are soothing and Tibetan and Hindu and many ancient cultures have meditated on mandalas for years. And this is one I drew actually at my mind body skills training program. Um, so in case you were wondering why this is important, because it matters to them. So purpose of healing images are how images heal. They get, in touch, get us in touch with ourselves so we can feel real, we matter, we can learn to know ourselves, and most importantly, love ourselves. They help us express difficult emotions, connect us to God, and create a sense of unity. Art helps us find our truth, remember play, enjoy the mystery, and live live with verve. Each of us has a deep desire to communicate our experiences so that others may know who we are, acknowledge our existence, validate our suffering, and celebrate our joys. And so in sharing, we may know ourselves. I painted this for someone that is very special and it really helped me just get in touch with that feeling for myself and then let it go. Art as medicine, in essence, is a visual representation of the soul's inherent striving towards balance and health. Art may be as close as we can come to seeing our souls. What's inside of yours? This, the little um, comment there on this page says, Inside it is colorful, outside is, it is white. Can I put my inside out? And I also just did this really briefly during an art therapy, one of my groups in Telluride. So that's a really great question that I ask myself constantly. So next up, I thought we would do a little neuroscience. So how does it work? Without getting too technical, scientists know that making art activates the relaxation response via the parasympathetic nervous system. This leads to a release of cytokines, neurotransmitters, and endorphins, which results in enhancement of immune response, feelings of happiness, and improved blood circulation. Where in the brain is Carmen Sandiego? <laughs> so my favorite game when I was younger, um, Creativity is generally thought of as the generation of novel ideas that are useful and meaningful to the self or others. Novelty production is quite a mystery. It may occur spontaneously or deliberately in cognitive or emotional structures or areas of the brain. So I read several different really dense articles about this and it was hotly debated about you know, where creativity is in the brain, but it's very interesting so I thought I'd present what I could about it. So once an idea is conscious, we don't really know exactly where it's coming from, but once it shows up, uh, the prefrontal cortex evaluates the appropriateness of the thought and mobilizes higher cognitive functions, such as attention, memory, abstract thinking, etc., to manage and express the idea. Many researchers believe that creative insights occur in a brain state of defocused attention. So if you get distracted, or that's one of the reasons for the other hand, um, just doing things that can really allow your, your mind to let go. Others argue that creativity is a state that can be practiced, selected for, and explored consciously, which is possibly the case for professional jazz musicians. The temporal lobes are thought to play some role since individuals with temporal lobe epilepsy also 
often note increased creativity around the time of a seizure, and individuals with frontotemporal dementia often report heightened creativity after the onset of their disease. Some scientists postulate that perhaps the temporal lobe actually inhibits excessive idea generation and in decreased activity, such as after a seizure or in dementia, more ideas flow through. The corpus callosum is considered an integral part of creative processing. Despite the controversy about where creativity is located, which seems to be in many areas, it does seem clear that good communication between both hemispheres is essential. Some scientists suggest that the most creative people are those with the most balanced use of both of their hemispheres, which is activity facilitated by the corpus callosum. And there's a lot of research, especially uh, done with musicians, showing that they have a lot more, a lot bigger, thicker corpus callosums, and so that has suggested that this possibly is what's going on. It must, might also help explain why left-handed people are thought to be more creative, because there may be more natural integration and ambidexterity. So the connection between mental illness and creativity. Many researchers have discussed the connection between creativity and mental illness. The view was apparently first put forward by Plato and later uh, by Emil Kraepelin, the German psychiatrist who gave us the distinction between manic depression and dementia, dementia praecox, which later became schizophrenia. It's an area of controversy, but some studies suggest that up to 70% of highly creative people, musical performers, visual artists, and writers especially, have comorbid psychiatric disorders being mainly bipolar and depression. The rate of alcoholism and other drug use is also very high, 30 to 60% highest in poets and musicians. And I read a whole book on this called um, um, the it's on the previous slide. The Price of Greatness, Resolving the Creativity and Madness Controversy by Arnold Ludwig, who's a psychiatrist at Brown. It's very fascinating, and he goes into all the different reasons why this is thought to be. And I'll give a couple of them, but it's a fascinating book if you're interested. So some of the reasons why this is thought to be are um, creative people are much more likely to ruminate. They are very reflective. They think about things really deeply. They have a heightened sensitivity to their inner and the outer world. Some research suggests that naturally creative types delve more readily into their unconscious and shadow sides pulling up deep and painful or rich and mysterious material. This may be due to an inherent sensitivity for or curiosity about emotional material, fantasy, and the unknown. And of course, taking oneself to the edge of your experiences puts you at much more risk of falling off. So, um, Why are creative people that way? This is also a little bit controversial and it's definitely multifactorial with genetics as well as environmental influences playing a large role. But creative people may literally be neurochemically wired to feel the need to ponder their experience and share what they find. So creative people, according to a research paper by Barron and Harrington in 1981, they have a couple of characteristics I thought I'd just report. They tend to follow intrinsic interests with passion and generally have less regard for extrinsic factors such as criticism, pressure for others, etc. They place a high value on the aesthetic qualities of life, have a tendency towards broad interests, an affinity for complexity, high energy, independence, intuition, self-confidence, the ability to tolerate conflicting traits in one's self-concept, and a solid sense of the self as creative. Are you creative? An interesting fact is that many of the creatively mentally, creative mentally ill interviewed through time were and are consciously using art and self-expression to help heal themselves. In others, it's probably still happening just unconscious. It's hard to separate the drive to create from the drive to heal. It seems that only an awareness of the benefit or purpose of the act of creation distinguishes the two. Okay, so the part you've all been waiting for. Not really more art. <laughs> um, I drew this in an airport when I was feeling kind of stressed one day. So I thought we would talk a little bit about data. And the truth is that there are a dearth of randomized controlled trials. There are lots and lots of kind of, I call them feel-good reports, 
um, there were reports with waitlist controls um, that weren't randomized or just um, case, case report type of things. Um, there were studies of art therapy, music therapy, poetry therapy, dance therapy, all kinds of different things. Um, and you might hypothesize that this is happening because um, people that are really creative don't tend to do as well with the structure and the numbers and all of that. So I think that they probably aren't as drawn to making randomized controlled trials. But it, more and more are starting to happen. So they're either collaborating or um, trying to integrate their hemispheres some more. So studies showed benefit for a range of creative activities for a wide variety of conditions, including trauma, sexual abuse, and other kinds of trauma, depression, schizophrenia, body image disorders, eating disorders, dementia, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, and cancer. There were studies that I read about poetry for failed suicide attempts, art for self-efficacy in adolescence, writing for pediatric oncology patients, art for dementia, art for depression, music for emotional disturbance, dance for depression, gardening for depression. The list goes on and on, and every study I read had some positive benefit. So how could I choose which ones to share? So one article that I really liked was called Arts and Healthcare, A New Paradigm for Holistic Nursing Practice by Mary Rockwood Lane, who's an, a nurse practitioner in Florida. She helped found this program called Arts and Medicine at the University of Florida with uh, John Graham Pohl, who's a pediatrician and poet and prominent leader in the healing arts. And this article just describes the process that she went through and it interested me because of my interest in making art therapy programs happen. So in this article, she describes the history of art in hospitals from initially something to look at that they discovered around the 60s that, oh, you know, let's make hospitals a little bit more fun. So they put up some art. And then they started realizing, oh, well, actually, the structure of the hospital might contribute to a healing environment. So they started making these really interesting buildings, such as the Children's Hospital in Houston is kind of has this huge circular atrium. and. You know, all these um, innovative designs started coming up and they started putting gardens in hospitals and, and fountains and different environmental aspects. And then they started doing performances in hospitals such as piano that we had here just um, last year, I believe, and, and they had that in my medical school and um, people playing harp and various things. And then finally to bedside art programs. She also, she, so she talks all about the process of getting this up and going, which is very interesting and what's going on at the University of Florida is they have this these artists in residence so they invite different artists to be a part of their program for different periods of time and they have a whole uh, panel of people working there including poets they have a barbershop quartet pianists puppeteers two-dimensional like painting and three-dimensional sculpture visual artists plus a whole separate section devoted to imagery meditation biofeedback and mind-body education so you can actually consult this team in the hospital and have them come to the bedside and educate your patient about meditation, do a guided imagery with your patient, and they work in the peds department, ob -GYN, they go to births, they do serenade people in the halls. It's really quite unbelievable. So a take-home point of this article is that hospital stays are shortened and pain medications are needed less when creative interventions are available to patients in an inpatient hospital setting. And that's the website, if you're curious, it's shans.org, A-I-M, Arts and Medicine. So a token randomized controlled trial. Art therapy improves coping resources, a randomized controlled study among women with breast cancer. This is from a university in Sweden. So some details about the study. It's kind of small, so that's a definite limitation. 20 people in the study group, 21 in the control. They used a scale called the CRI, Coping Resources Inventory, to measure coping skills and strategies. The study showed statistically significant improvement, specifically in the social domain of the CRI in the treatment group versus control. Social domain measured extent of embeddedness in social networks that could provide support during stress. So some thoughts that I had about this was that if coping is defined as flexible, realistic thoughts and behaviors that help solve problems and reduce stress, 
then it seems only natural that artistic work, which encourages and strengthens creativity, which in itself is about novelty, flexibility, and appropriateness, would improve coping resources. Given their own personal time for reflection and integration, women developed their ability to rely more on others. That was sort of interesting. But, so it's fascinating, as it has been shown that solid social networks improve survival and quality of life after a cancer diagnosis. So one more interesting study is a randomized controlled trial of mindfulness-based art therapy for women with cancer. So it incorporates elements of mindfulness-based stress reduction, which I've personally trained in with John Kabat-Zinn um, from the Center for Mindfulness in Massachusetts and art therapy. So the goal is to provide skills for self-regulation, not confined to the verbal domain. So not just about talking. Tools to help patients witness, interpret, and manage their objective and subjective representations of their illness. The belief is that making art may activate right hemisphere, leading to increased awareness of emotional responses, especially related to threatening events such as trauma or cancer diagnosis. The project also included a verbal articulation stage where patients described their images and what they represent. So this was more of a left hemisphere part of the activity. So both hemispheres of the brain are integrated and coordinated in this kind of approach. This bilateral hemispheric integration has been pro proposed in previous studies to be an integral feature of resolution of past trauma. As mentioned before, integration between two hemispheres is a key component of creativity. So some details about the study. 55 people um, in the weightless control group and 56 in the study group, all active cancer patients. Eight-week program, there was a 16-week follow-up, and they used an SCL90R rating scale, which was a symptoms checklist revised rating scale. 50% of the patients had breast cancer. So the results, there was a statistically significant decrease in symptoms of distress measured by the SCL90 uh, depression and anxiety scales. There were subscales related to hostility, obsessive compulsive traits, interpersonal sensitivity, and somatization that were also significantly improved in the intervention group over control. The conclusion was that the mindfulness-based art therapy is successful at helping patients lower distress levels and improve quality of life. One of the ways this happens is by shifting patients' focus to a life perspective that is broader than one that defines them as a cancer patient. And it, it was also notable that at the 16-week follow-up, all of the benefits were still present. They hadn't diminished at all. So what can you do? Incorporate into your work or refer. A few ways you might incorporate this into your work include encouraging journaling, asking patients about dreams, suggesting a sketchbook, or asking, the patient, asking your patients what they're already doing that's creative. I had a really interesting um, experience with a patient last week. I was you know, kind of getting ready for this talk and thinking about how despite being so interested in creativity, unless my patients bring it to me, I don't often just start talking about it with them. So I brought it up with a patient that I'd never talked about it before and his energy totally changed and he got so excited and told me he used to draw in college and uh, he was going to go back to it and he was going to, you know, bring in some artwork and you know it just totally shifted the whole dynamic between us and I'd been working with him for a year and a half and I'd never seen him and take on that kind of pride or pleasure so it's really interesting so help them cultivate what they're already doing it might be gardening cooking poetry sewing support them in their efforts to nurture a creative hobby reinforce the importance by asking them about their work or having them bring something in Encourage patients to think and talk about the art, about what the art garden meal, music, poem, etc., means to them. And then there are things like little exercises that you can do, kind of like what we did today, or um, one is really popular called Morning Pages that came from um, a thing that's called the Artist's Way. That's a, a popular creativity development program. But Morning Pages are just every morning for about 20 minutes, you get up first thing, you have a journal, and you just write whatever comes out without any censorship. You can't go back and change any of it. You're not supposed to really even look at it. You just write everything that comes out. You can also do um, what I call daily doodles, and I try to do this with my non-dominant hand. And sometimes I 
you know, use chalk and um, just things that are, are hard to be precise with. So it's a lot more just about um, getting into the other hemisphere. So you want to make it happen often. Try to do something every day. Try to make it fun and more about the act of creating than a polished product to minimize self-censorship. So some resources and um, I don't know if you guys have a handout, but these aren't in there because I just added them today. So apologize for that. I could send them out to everyone on email. But the Southern Arizona Friends of Young has a list of some people who are art therapists in town on there. Um, the International Expressive Arts Therapy Organization does different conferences and their website's in development, but it eventually should have some things about re referrals, referral sources. And Natalie Rogers' website, I put that on there because I just find her work really interesting. I've been sort of kind of backseat studying her books for like maybe seven years now. This is Carl Rogers' daughter, and she teaches workshops for, for professionals such as us in art therapy and will kind of give you professional skills to use. But she also has a really great book called, I think it's called The Creative Companion, that will teach you a lot. And Anna Halperin is a healer that does dance. She was a performer for many, many years, and she integrates art and movement and word into uh, one whole program for people and I've done her training and it was transformational it was really wonderful she does weekend workshops at the Mount Madonna Center and um, Kripalu and various different um, Omega Institute and that sort of thing Gabrielle Roth is another favorite teacher and mentor of mine she is a healer out of the Esalen, out of Esalen Institute in California. She lives in New York City, but she teaches what's called five rhythms. It's a kind of dance therapy that's extremely transformational. So I want to thank Dr. Gilbert for his references and guidance during the planning and creation of the talk, and my friend Leah Hennington, who's a professional art therapist, who helped me with the exercise in the beginning. And then I just included a bibliography. The end is really a beginning. That's me hula hooping. So that's all I have.